Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sam Bass. I'm with the Market Intelligence team here at Open Minds. And today, as part of our weekly private roundtable series, we have Open Minds Executive Vice President Laird Saper and Senior Associate Nicole Garris, and they'll be discussing designing best in class websites. Laird brings a diverse background of user experience design, project management, customer service, and over 10 years of web development experience to the Open Minds team. In her role as Vice President of Web Services, Laird uh, leads our team of web developers, brings technical guidance and business practicality to every web-based application that Open Minds develops, and defines a strategic purpose and unique digital brand for each client project that crosses her path. Nicole Garris is an award-winning senior marketing and graphic design associate, bringing over 12 years of experience to Open Minds clients and projects. Creating and developing compelling brand is her primary passion, followed closely by delivering an intriguing and connected customer journey through strategic omni-channel marketing plans. Now, before we get started, we have a couple of brief housekeeping reminders. While you are muted during today's briefing, we are interested in any questions that you might have. Please feel free to submit those in the question box that's gonna be on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll get to those at the end. And secondly, as a reminder, uh, the recording and PowerPoint slide from today's briefing will be available tomorrow on the Open Minds website. And without further ado, Nicole and Laird. Thanks, Sam. Yes, thank you. We're excited to be here. So on today's agenda, we're going to talk about how to define your goals for your website, how to meet the needs of your website users, how to present and organize your content for usability, how to assess your content for accessibility, and how to measure and adjust. After today's session, you should be able to align your strategic business goals with potential target audiences, develop a basic understanding of user experience and why it is important to provider organizations, understand usability best practices and demonstrate how those concepts can be applied to your website, understand the impact that accessibility has on usability and user satisfaction, develop website content that resonates with your intended audience, and understand the basic metrics all sites should track and how to use them to evaluate your website's performance. Thanks, Laird, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you guys so much for having me on um, today's webinar. Um, so to kick it off, I'm gonna start off with how to define um, your goals. So this is the first thing you should consider whether you're developing a new website or are assessing your current website. Um, so you always wanna start off by defining your business goals. So really sit down and think about what your ultimate driver is for your business, um, whether that be grow the client base, attract new talent, um, just raise overall awareness for uh, advocacy purposes, um, convert your visitors, um, you know, help people find a resource or more information on a topic or even message a provider or book an appointment. Um, typically, once you get these outlined for your business, you want to translate that down into mapping out your goals to those potential target audiences. So if we're thinking of the goal as growing our client base, we're going to look at the target audience being consumers, caregivers, or referral sources in that kind of way. So you would go through that which each of, with each of the goals that you have defined, um, whether it be attracting talent, so you're looking at prospective employees, interns, volunteers, um, just mapping out who exactly these people are that are aligning with your goals and who are your target audience. Um, once you get that target audience kind of clearly defined, identify who those people's, people are, we're gonna look at meeting the needs of the user. Oops, and that was my we go. Um, yeah, so once we get that target audience defined, you're going to take a deep dive into them and get to know and understand your audience. Um, so first of all, you're going to look at developing your tone and your voice on the site. Um, so there's a lot of things that can be said about this. Um, you know, depending on who your target audience is, you're going to want to use formal language versus casual language. Um, when you look at like younger audiences, you could use um, some more casual type languages versus older audiences, which might be more formal. Business to consumer typically is a little bit more casual, informational, um, and then business to business would be more of that formality, more informational, educational kind of tone of voice that you want to take 
with that target audience. Um, so this will help you inform the architecture and the flow and all the front end development that'll guide your website as well. I always um, think so um, tone, I was just sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Nicole. I was just going to say, I think uh, one of the interesting things about tone to me is that it's more, I mean, it, it encompasses voice, but it also encompasses style. If you look at some of the younger brands out there, I was thinking about the makeup brand Glossier. They um, not only use the text that they're using, and it's very informal, very targeted towards their younger audience, but the colors and sort of the whole casual vibe of their site also helps project that tone. So I always think that's sort of an yes. interesting tie-in too. Tone is more like it's it's everything about the style and the voice of yes. your site, I think. Yes, and that's a great great point. It's not only your content or your language, it is also your design style as well that can help uh, replicate and amplify that tone or voice that you're setting on your site. Yeah, exactly. Um, the second thing to do that is just mapping out your user's journey. So um, the steps that impact their overall experience on your site, whether it be positive, negative, um, just what do you, when they come to your site, what questions do they want to get answered? Um, what are they looking for to get out of your site? Are they looking to book an appointment? Um, and you're going to try to map out that experience overall for your website in the most simple to use um, frictionless way that you can come up with for them. Back to choosing kind of your tone and your voice, that clear and precise language is always key. So as say what you need to say to get them informed about what you do, what services you offer, what you can provide them um, in as little language as you can. So very clear, concise, summarized language. Um, also, I mean, a good thing to think about when you're thinking about voice and tone for your target audiences is think about what kind of language they use when they are searching to find solutions to their problem. So, you know, if I'm a patient and I have um, symptoms of major depressive disorder, if I'm looking on the internet, they are probably not going to type in major depressive disorder. They might type in depression, sadness, things of that nature. So make sure your target audience language that is on your website is gonna be reflective of what your audience is searching for and what tools they're using to find you online as well. Absolutely. I think the interesting thing here too is that with the increased ability of search engines to anticipate and mimic human natural language, the more that we're able to anticipate and put ourselves in our users' shoes, the better we are able to actually maximize the um, search engine um, use of our, our language. So if we use the same words that our users are going to be using to search for us, we're going to rank higher in uh, search engine ranking so yes on the back side too um in addition when you use that type of language that they're familiar with what they're used to um you can really help to ease their concerns as well and help improve their understanding of what they're getting from you too um, once you kind of set that tone at ease you can help strike a sense of urgency or inspire change with call to actions throughout your site too um, and really to kind of capitalize on laird's point um, SEO is favoring that more genuine tone, um, you know, that very genuine, concise language, the same type of language that your users will be using, and really favoring that on a technical standpoint as well. Absolutely. All right. And why do you need to understand your audience? Um, so if you're understanding your audience and completely seeing where they're coming from, that can help guide the design of your site and guide them through the actions you'd like them to take on your site to get them to achieving your business goals and help them achieve what they're trying to achieve as well. Um, so they are going to try to meet them wherever you are on their journey, um, wherever they find you on their path to receiving your product or service. This can also help you anticipate ways in which your customers are going to be more comfortable uh, filling out or getting in contact with you or meeting the needs that they're trying to meet. So for instance, a user in crisis who is seeking assistance is gonna probably be more likely to be comfortable with a phone call versus filling out a contact mm -hmm. form where they're not experiencing a personal interaction. Um, so thinking about things like that, is this person 
is the person at this point in the experience on my site, what is their likely emotional state? What is the level of urgency of the task they're completing? If you can put yourself in, your, in the, that person's shoes at that point in the process, you can help alleviate a lot of stress and help your users uh, accomplish their tasks a lot more comfortably for them and a lot more quickly. Completely agree. So, and then kind of building off of that, once you have that kind of understanding of where they're coming from, um, when they seek out this kind of um, service or product that you offer, um, again, putting yourself in their shoes, when they get to the site, let's anticipate the questions that the user will have so we can make sure to answer them on our site. Um, so we're helping them as much as we can as soon as they get to the site, especially if they are in that kind of crisis mode, so it's easy to find the information that they need and the answers that they want as soon as they possibly can. So then when we look at this at a big picture scale, that's just a little piece of it. Um, we call this the user journey. Um, so this is the overall user journey. Um, the website is a piece of this, but we're gonna start mapping this at the very beginning when say the user um let's say when they would get started thinking that they need your product or service so let's say they're experiencing symptoms of major depressive disorder and they need they're going to start looking for your service then from there where, where are they going to look for your service you know what terms are they using um where are they going to find referrals information your website then once they get to your website kind of going through that um and then the appointment the follow-up and then the feedback. So it's kind of this large loop, whether it be virtual services, um, in-person services, and a combination of those experiences um, all together. Absolutely. I also think um, using these sorts of journeys and these journey maps is a very useful tool for sitting down with all stakeholders in your organization, because frequently your developer team is gonna have a piece of the picture. They may not see the full user journey. If you sit down with your development team or your uh, marketing team and every single person in your organization sees this user journey, they're all going to have the same view of what your purpose and mission is in a very graphic way, um, which can lead to really great brainstorming and really great ideas for how you can, you know, maybe meet the needs of your user in different and creative ways. Maybe you can see a spot where the virtual and the live can interact and create an even better opportunity for your organization or your user. Yes, 100 percent. So talking about that. Okay. So part of this is user experience. So you probably all heard this term. Sometimes it is referred to just as UX. In general, user experience refers to the entire experience your user is having with your brand or company. Uh, when we're talking about websites, we're generally referring to the experience the user is having specifically with the website. Um, so we're talking about the idea of UX is the attempt to design your product and your website to meet the needs of the people. And the design is meant to be designed around uh, the people knowing what they already know. Instead of teaching them something new or trying to make them change to fit your product, you're designing your product around them. Um, this, this results in a lot less friction with the user because they're not trying to, you know, they don't have to learn something new, they don't have to use a manual, they don't have to ask for instructions, you don't have to walk anybody through. So if you can design your product around uh, pathways that people already know to use, you're going to have more success. Yes, I just like to add in here, I know there's, we'll mention this later in the program, but um, user experience and user interface are sometimes used interchangeably. Um, main difference here is that experience is referring more to um, functionality, um, whereas interface is more referring to the actual design of the website. Absolutely. So every time somebody has a good experience with your website, they're more likely to come back. If they have an unpleasant one, they're not likely to come back. Um, unpleasant experiences don't have to be actually unpleasant. They just need to be not pleasant, um, which is interesting. So if people don't get what they need from your website, if they can't find the information they're looking for, that actually qualifies as an unpleasant experience and they're not likely to return. Yes, exactly. 
Great. So let's talk about how to present and organize our content for um, usability. Um, so basically, if we can summarize this up, if a website is either difficult to use, um, which would be kind of tying into that user experience piece, um, if it does not communicate what your product or service is very clearly, um, or if it's difficult to navigate through, say you get stuck on a page or an action or something doesn't happen um, confirming that they took an action, the mm -hmm. um, user is more likely to leave. And, you know, we really can't blame them. Um, that's a bad, bad, bad user experience on their part. Right. Um, and really, you know, speaking back to the tone and voice, the fourth bullet here, if a website's information is hard to read or doesn't answer their questions, they leave. So, you know, gearing things toward that grade six to eight reading level is important. Using the language that people are already familiar with is important to keep them there. And then, I mean, I always use these in marketing all the time, but you've got to answer these questions on your web pages, throughout your marketing, everything with your brand. What do you want me to know and what do you want me to do on your website? So information architecture uh, is what we talk about when we refer to how to organize the content on your website. Uh, when we talk about information architecture, we are talking about um, an intentional organization of the information and content. Um, some guiding principles are to group like items. So if we think about the example of a blog, um, if you look at your average blog, articles might be grouped by topic, they might be grouped by author, they might be grouped by date. They are usually grouped by a number of those things. Um, most people understand this. It makes it easy to navigate and find the, the content that is most relevant to the reader. Um, additionally, you want to assign hierarchy. Without hierarchy on your website, all of the content is going to appear to your reader to be uh, equally important. So what you want to do is make sure that you're indicating to your reader which content is more important. There are always pieces of content that are more important than others. Um, so we do this by indicating through links to other content on our website. We do this through navigation links. Um, so when used properly, your navigation, your hierarchy um, is a really powerful way to lead your users through your experience and make sure that they have the content that they need, and the resources that they need to get where you want them to go. Third, uh, a third consideration is that you want to determine the shelf life of the content. So in terms of shelf life, two key questions to ask about each piece of content are, will this content be relevant in one month, six months, two years? And what is the likelihood that this piece of content will be updated with ongoing structured frequency? Yes, completely agree. Um, when you, this is a outline of examples of grouped like items. So, you could, for example, group items by who do you serve, children, caregivers, patients, parents, et cetera, or what services are offered, employment support, housing support, et cetera. You could also group by delivery of those services or location of where those services are served. Yes, and these buckets that you're putting these in really help not only organize the content, but also the structure of your site. So this could be easily translated into the website navigation um, to help the users and improve the user experience, find out the questions that are typically asked and access these much more quickly. Absolutely. Um, so touching back on that assigning hierarchy, I wanted to provide a really bad example um, to compare it to, but um, here's why it's important. When we look at this page, I mean, the first thing that strikes me and stands out to me is that the paid ad is the thing that first draws my attention, which you never want to do. If you have people that are paying to put ads on your site, they should not be the primary hierarchy. But um, the importance is when you look at this page, you don't know where to look first. You don't know what's the most important. This is overwhelming and confusing to a user um, and can be very distracting to get them to take the steps and the actions that you want them to take to get to your business goals and achieve those business goals via your website. Um, a piece of this is chunking out your content. I know we touched on that with the bucketing, um, but also if you have longer pieces of content or longer bits of information that you want to share, um, we really need to summarize those and use those short kind of sentences and paragraphs um, to help break that up and to help users absorb it quickly. 
um, so that if they're looking at your homepage, you want them to know, you know, the things you offer, what you do very, very quickly and to get them to the spots that you want to get them to. So you can create these short sentences, intro, uh, intro, introductory paragraphs, um, subheadings, um, use some graphics with those, um, call outs, you know, um, and also provide ample white space to kind of separate this and highlight this from the rest of your content, which may not be as important that you want the user to experience it real. Mm -hmm. um, so here's just kind of an example of that visually when we chunk that content together. Here's the three things we want our people to know first. We've got a graphic to draw the eye in for attention. We've got that subhead. We put patients first. Our model is different. Um, we are risk takers and problem solvers. And then for each of those, we have those introductory paragraphs and learn more, the call to action to get the user to take the next step to get that, that higher level content, that long explanation of why our model is different, of why we are risk takers, et cetera. The uh, other part of the, the UX UI hand-in-hand uh, -hand friendship is the user interface. Um, sometimes these are used as interchangeable terms, but they are related, but not the same. User interface is more the visual interaction portion. Um, this is the point at which your user actually interacts with your product or your, in this case, website. Um, one of the most important things that you can do is to be predictable. This may not sound very exciting, but a predictable website is typically a useful website. So when you're deciding about the main layout of your site, like things where to put the navigation, where to put the logo, where to put uh, fundamental things that are usually in typical places um, on most websites, the navigation is usually at the top under the, under the logo on most websites. This is not the time to reinvent the wheel or to try something fun and new. You don't want people to have to hunt for this information. Just make it, just put it where it is everywhere else. This is not something you want your users to have to hunt for. Um, additionally, in terms of your own um, modules and your own language and your own um, content, you want to be predictable and consistent with the way you use those. So if you use one kind of button on your site, you want to be consistent with the way that you use that button um, so that it always kind of means the same thing to your user. If they see a bright red button, it means the same thing every time it's used. Additionally, and I think Nicole already talked about this a little bit, white space is so important. Um, it could not be more important in websites. The reason is that people consume content vastly differently online than they do in person. If you're reading a newspaper, a great big chunk of content is not gonna bother you. You can read on paper a large piece of text without it tiring your eyes, but when you're looking at a screen, it's harder to do. So people tend to skim more to find key text. So that is why it is really important to give your text, give your elements on your page room to breathe so that your user can scan and easily find the key elements on the page. All of this really boils down to the goal of reducing friction for your user. Um, every, every time your user has to hesitate, every time your user has to wonder what they're doing next or they have to ask what's happening in the background, that is causing friction for your user. And that's a time at which your user might leave your site and abandon your service. So every single time you can, you wanna reduce friction for your user. Um, you wanna think about how many actions you're asking a user to take on a page. You wanna ask yourself, does the user really need to give me this information at this point? Or can, they, can I get it from them later? Is it even really that important? Um, you know, if you're asking somebody to sign up for your newsletter, newsletter, do you really need their first and last name? Maybe not, you can make those fields optional. You could ask them to fill them out later. Um, anything you can do to reduce friction and ease the process for your user is going to build a more successful experience. Yes, absolutely agree. Think of how many times you've left, um, you know, signing up for a newsletter because they asked for your first name, last name, address, et cetera. Yes. When really all you want to provide is your email address so you can receive that information. Um, so just be aware, you know, how you use stuff too. Um, and interact with things can also be applied here. Mm -hmm. All right, so building off of Laird's um, overview there, the first thing with the be consistent, um, I call this training the, the customer. So um, our calls to action throughout the site, we're gonna do it with buttons that are similar color, size, shape, and font. 
Um, so we can see in some of these examples, this lovely kind of oval shape, pink color, same font. We know exactly where these buttons are that they want us to take an action on. Um, and as this is replicated over site, it, changed, it trains the user to look for these colors, shapes, sizes, um, if they want to take the next step and the next action. It makes it so much simpler on the user and it also trains them to look for these on other pages throughout your site and get through the actions much quicker and complete mm -hmm. them. Um, capitalizing on embracing white space as a former graphic designer, this is one that I love to talk about. <laughs> Um, white space will never, the, less is more. So less text, more white space, um, better intro paragraphs, summarize as much as you can. I mean, you can see with these examples, uh, you absorb the information so much quicker. There's a clear hierarchy. So we definitely want to read this. The intro paragraph, here's our training with the buttons. Um, here it is again with Apple. And then some other standard information that they wanted to pull out and pop. So this is not overwhelming. I could absorb this very quickly. Um, I know what exactly what action they want me to take and where I want to go. And then there's a clear, you know, navigation. There's a hamburger menu up here. Um, but it really pulls out the hierarchy and the information you want the user to absorb first, second, and third. Um, and makes that very clear, very easy to understand, and very easy to take action on. And interestingly, another uh, benefit of having more white space on your site is that your site will age better. Uh, so sites have a much longer shelf life in terms of design, the more white space they have. Uh, you're a lot less likely to have to go through visual design iterations frequently mm -hmm. if you have more white space on your site, they just age better. Mm -hmm. It's a classic look. <laughs> Um, here's some of the stuff we want to avoid. Um, so I'm giving this as a common example because sometimes people think the more information you can provide on, for example, a page, the better it is. Um, and it's actually the opposite is true, right? Um, so if I'm a user, and I, I'll compare those last examples with those simple blocks of text that I can quickly read, understand, get through, move to the next act if I'd like to. Um, or if you have something like this listed on your site, which is you know, overwhelming, intimidating, there's not a call to action. Um, most people are never going to look at this, even though it seems like it's taking up a lot of real estate on your site, um, a lot of space visually, um, but it is visual clutter is what I'll call it um, yeah. to the user and they'll most likely avoid it and not read this piece. Um, the final piece of um, what we covered here is reducing friction. So, you know, anything that prevents the user from achieving the outcome that they want to achieve on your website. Um, so, you know, as you're checking out, you're buying an item on a cart. Um, basically, these are feedback loops that we close on the website to say, hey, thank you for submitting your contact form. We'll be in touch with you within, you know, 24 hours, say, or, um, you know, uh, Thank you for reaching out for more information. We'll be sure to get in touch with you or having a call item that will call. Um, so if we show that, we use that with um, visual cues and prompts. So everybody's familiar with the cart item. If you add an item to your cart, the number goes up. So you can see clearly that you've added another item and it is in your cart. Um, if you're downloading or uploading something, you have that little status bar that kind of um, plays out in front of you so you can see something is happening that it is in fact uploading you just didn't hit the button and hope that it is going to appear there um, and finally kind of these status uh, step-by-step bars that people can follow along with too so, um, if you have a multi-step process say they're booking an appointment then they have to provide you know the date the time a preferred doctor you name it um, outlining the steps to complete the task at hand can also help encourage the completion of the user because they are seeing progress as they complete steps one, two, three, four, um, and then finally achieve their final outcome. Exactly. If you do have to ask your user for a lot of information or there are a number of steps, if you can give them a progress bar, they're less likely to get frustrated and abandon the process because they know where they are. Yes. Okay, now we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is web accessibility. Um, I'm very passionate about this, uh, just as I am about responsive design. So when I first started in web design, um, responsive design, the fact that you would have a mobile design was just kind of starting to be the norm. 
Um, and now it is inconceivable that you would launch a website without it being mobile friendly. And, and that's a great thing. Accessibility is starting to become the same type of thing. When we're talking about accessibility, we are talking about, sure, making sure that our websites are usable by people with disabilities, uh, visual disabilities for one, so people that are using screen readers or different input modalities, um, people that are using keyboards to navigate the site, et cetera. We're also talking about the ability of our websites to be used on a variety of devices with a variety of internet speeds um, to be used by a variety of people using a variety of inputs, mice, whatever it may be. Um, this is so important, not only on a human level, um, because you do want to make sure that whoever wants to use your product and interact with your brand can, but it's also important from a search engine optimization standpoint because search engines are also beginning to prioritize this. Already Google will penalize you if you have empty alt tags on your site. Um, these are image, images with text explanations on them. You should have those on your website. So when we're talking about accessibility, the four main things to keep in mind are that your content should be perceivable by all. So your design and your content should be presented so that all users can access the information. This doesn't mean it needs to look the same in all environments for all users, but that it should be perceivable. So contrast, adequate provision of those text alternatives for images, et cetera, and adaptable layouts. Your website should also be operable. So your content should be keyboard accessible, navigable. It should accept multiple input modalities. Um, your text and your website should be understandable. The text should be readable. The text, the functionality should be predictable. And the cues, like Nicole was going over, should be in place to help users avoid mistakes and understand where they are in the process. And finally, the site should be robust. Your content should be able to be interpreted reliably via a wide variety of user agents and devices. I don't think there is even a way to list the wide variety of devices out there that are internet accessible now. So um, the robustness is very, very key. Um, essentially, what applies, the same rules that apply to usability apply to accessibility. If your website is not accessible, people will leave. Uh, so it is really important, not only on a human level, but also increasingly on a search engine level. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some examples just to chime in here of what accessibility is looking like um, for users. So tying into that target audience, if you're going after an older audience, you might wanna think about increasing font size. Um, yep. I know a lot of older users often struggle with reading some of the smaller font size and designs on sites. Um, you know, if you are in a practice in an area with a um, Spanish speaking population, you may consider getting some of your materials or some of your information translated to Spanish to help people access your content um, within their native, native as well. So I'm seeing a lot of those examples out in the field now. That's a really good example. So we talk about device agnostic design or responsive design, which means that when your website is used on an iPhone or on a Samsung phone or on any phone, or on a tablet or on a desktop or on a giant screen, whatever it, whatever it may be, the person using your website should still be able to have a good experience. Apple does obviously a really phenomenal job of this. You can see a really good example here. So this is the Apple site on an iPhone and the Apple site on a desktop. And while the layout is a bit different, it is still incredibly the same. So I can still access the exact same stuff same content, I still have the same experience as a user. Mm -hmm. Yes, and from a design perspective, I mean, you're looking at the layout, you know, if you have certain a number of columns, if you have like three columns, for example, collapsing into that one column layout to be adjustable for mobile devices as well. Mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about color and contrast to help with that accessibility, um, color can be used and also contrast to help define hierarchy, um, to create legibility. I mean, how many people have seen either a PowerPoint or some kind of uh, material or website that um, somebody put a dark font on a dark background and you just can't read it? Um, mm -hmm. So keeping that contrast level up, um, helping to highlight the tone with the colors. So that expressive nature, um, if you have a more playful, fun, um, casual tone, you're gonna use more playful, fun colors. 
Um, same thing with the vice versa. So a bank website is clearly going to have different colors from um, hip trendy makeup brand, right? right. Um, so using those colors um, to express the brand, create hierarchy, and keep things legible is key. Very much so. Luckily, there are some really phenomenal tools that can help with this. One of my favorites is actually the Google Color Tool, which is a free tool online that will help you create palettes or test your existing color palettes for contrast and, and give you uh, feedback on whether the contrast is appropriate or whether it needs to be changed. So you can test your foreground colors and your background colors with this tool to determine if the contrast is acceptable and will work for most people. Yes, this is extremely helpful, thank you. Um, so when we're assessing accessibility, the good news is there's a lot of free tools out there that can help you test and make improvements on your site. Some of my favorites are the Google Lighthouse tool, which is a wonderful tool that can not only diagnose some speed issues on your site, uh, but it also helps diagnose accessibility issues. The Bureau of Internet Accessibility also has a great online testing tool. Userway.org is a really phenomenal one. And the Wave website accessibility evaluation is phenomenal. That's the um, feature to the right there. All of these will give you quick, free, actionable insights and specific steps to take to improve some of the accessibility issues on your site. One of the things to remember with accessibility is that these, this is going to be an ongoing process. So you shouldn't just assess your site once and then call it a day. This should probably be something you do monthly, at least, or um, on, a, on an ongoing basis. Test periodically so that you make sure that your content is growing in accessibility always. Gotcha. And Larry, I just wanted to ask a question um, for our audience today. I don't know if you said this, but are these tools all free? Yes, all of these tools are free. Oh, very good. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to go on to once we have gone through and implemented all these steps, how do we know they're working? So we're going to talk about how to measure and adjust. Perfect. Um, so I'll get it started with um, how we're going to measure success via our website. Um, so first of all, once we define those um, goals that we want to achieve for our business, we'll have to set um, some KPIs or key performance indicators that align with those business goals. So we're going to set actual numbers, stats, measurements that go with those for the goal. Um, and then we're going to measure, collect, and adjust. Um, so once we define that set of KPIs that align with your business goals, we're going to do quantitative studies such as A-B testing. Heat maps are um, basically to measure where people are clicking on your site. So we can see design-wise what's working, what's not working, um, or if people are utilizing something that we didn't have you know, set up hierarchy-wise, they're utilizing a button in the right-hand corner. We can pull that out and bring that as the focus um, so we can get more people to use it and reach their uh, business or what they want to accomplish on your site. And of course, by using the standard website analytics um, to look at traffic, engagement, and conversions. Um, also, qualitative research. Um, these are survey um, focus groups, just any kind of that loop of feedback or interviews um, to get performance measures. So how do we do? Um, how did our website do for you? Um, how was our service? That kind of thing. There are some phenomenal uh, analytics. Most people use Google Analytics, and these are all Google Analytics metrics that are um, being shown here. Um, typically, the metrics that are most valuable to a website are the metrics that measure on some level user engagement. All of these metrics here are ones that I would say look at them as trends. Um, these are trends that are industry specific. So a number that is good for one organization may be different than the number that is um, a target number for another organization. It really is very um, industry specific. Um, it usually takes about three months to get a solid baseline for your own organization. So if you're just starting to collect analytics, know that it's going to take about three months to get a good baseline to understand your actual traffic and your own metrics. Once you have that initial baseline though, you should be able to look at these numbers and see a trend. With users and unique visitors, you always want that to be trending upward. With sessions, pages per session and session duration, again, you want that to be trending upward. Those are all signs that 
people are more engaged with your site and your brand. Uh, speed is one that's uh, actually not user engagement, that is just a straight up measurement of your website speed, but it impacts users' engagement with your site. Um, you can test your site speed with free tools like Lighthouse, the Google Lighthouse tool, Pingdom, which uh, you can test at tools.pingdom.com. Um, it's really important to test those, the, both the mobile and the desktop view because those will load differently. Um, but back to Google Analytics, the bounce rate, which is an indicator of people that come to your website, land on a page and leave from the site, from the page they came in on without taking any other action. That means they landed and they were like, I don't want to be here, and they left. Um, the conversion rate, number of conversions, so whether it's people submitting a form, contacting you, signing up, completing a purchase, your through traffic, which is the percent of your visitors that navigate to another page on your website, and then the page depth, which is the number of pages that your, your, that your, your users view per session. Um, so mm -hmm. over time, you really want to look at these as trends. You want most of these to be increasing upwards. You want your bounce rate to be de decreasing and you want your speed to be increasing, to be decreasing. You want it to load faster. Yes, and a, a bounce rate can also tie back into if your website is too difficult to use, understand, <laughs> or know what to do with. So people mm -hmm. are getting to your site, they don't understand what you offer. If they get to your site, they don't know what to do next. Go on. Exactly. Um, so the it can also be a really great tool to look at if your website is accessible and usable. Um, conversion rate is your language that you're using, is your tone of voice coming across correctly and really connecting with your target audience. Um, mm -hmm. So if it, you'll definitely see that conversion rate continue to grow, to continue to get stronger. Um, if it's not, you might see you know the baseline and then very stagnant or very minimal growth. Um, mm -hmm. So then you might look at adjusting some language or adjusting the overall design. Is the call to action clear? Is, are the buttons consistent and training the user to know where to go? Um, to are you asking for they... too many steps? Yes. Are you asking the right question or answering the right questions? Mm -hmm. So really those two, like if I had to cherry pick out of these, those two would be my key metrics that I am looking at um, to see how my website's really doing if I'm connecting I have a good design and a good um, user experience there. Absolutely, I agree. Just kind of, I think this page has the better KPI. So this is just sort of a um, chart that will show you sort of what you would want these trends to be. Um, so again, all of the ones that measure engagement for the most part, we want the engagement to increase. So through traffic, page up, unique views, et cetera, we want those to increase. We want bounce rate to decrease and we want the percent of exit uh, to decrease. Yes, exactly. This is a really great summary slide. So I'm glad this will be available um, for users. And that brings us to our questions. Okay. Hey, Laird and Nicole. Thank you so much for that presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, just want to remind everyone, we do have some time for some Q&A here at the end. So please uh, feel free to submit any questions that you might have for them. And looks like we have a question coming in. Let's say we just listened to your fabulous presentation and we're taking a look at our website and we're realizing that all of it's wrong, the user experience, the user interface, all the stats, and you wanted to start tomorrow. Uh, do any of those have a priority? Like, what, which would you put first on your list of things to fix? Nicole might disagree, but I think I would start with user experience. What about you, Nicole? No, I, I actually completely agree. Even with uh, as much as I want things to look really nice, that's my graphic design background and sales. Um, it's got to be functional first. You've got to have the language, the functionality first before you can make it look good and really drive home those design principles to capitalize for you. I agree. Once you have the design down and you know it's functioning properly, then you can change the interface. You can do some great A-B testing um, and really, you know, fine tune um, and make some great changes that way. Once you do that, I think your metrics will follow. Gotcha. That makes sense. As somebody who uses the internet, you know, uh, you're, I think you're willing to put up with the poor looking site that works really well and is functional. Yeah. 
I don't know how much we talked about this, but like, I think Amazon is a really good example of that, right? Like it's visually sort of ugly, but it's very functional. I think it's numbers speak to that. So while it wouldn't be the site that I would design just from a visual perspective, it is certainly one I shop on a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think <laughs> most people do. So it, it clearly gets the job done. Um, so first and foremost, functionality. Absolutely. And um, the next question would be, could you address uh, social media impact on your website and like how do those two interplay and what should have a priority? Well, I can kick it off. Sure. <laughs> um, from a marketing perspective, I mean, you always want to have a social media presence, um, but really your social media should drive traffic back to your website. So you never want to try to keep it and grow up your channel without the goal of directing traffic to your website or providing some kind of contact form depending on the channel, um, mm -hmm. which is very, very important um, to choose the right channels. And I know a lot of people get hyped on some of the newer and want to jump into social media platforms, yep. but um, you do have a commitment. Once you get into a social media platform, you need to be posting consistently um, you need to extend that tone and voice from your website um, across your social media brands as well. Um, and then you need to be measuring all that as well. So that's a, it's a great arm and a tool, I think, to support the growth and um, tone and voice of your website and your brand. Um, and I'll let Laird comment more on, you know, how that ties in. I love what you just said about it being a commitment, though. Um, I know it's really easy to get excited about the latest, newest social media channel. They're fun. Who doesn't get excited about that? But I do think it is a commitment, especially when it's your business, because every link outside of your site is basically a road to somewhere. And you want to make sure anywhere you're taking your you're taking your readers or your clients or your, your user base, that you're leading them somewhere you want them to be. So if you started a social media channel and you're, you've linked to it from your website and you don't post there anymore, you've essentially led your users on a road to nowhere. And when they get there, if they're not coming yeah. back to your website, they're going to get distracted by whatever else is on the social media channel. So that's, it's yeah. a commitment and something to take seriously. Um, so I think, like, like Nicole said, your, your website should be the center of the universe and all your social yes. media should be in orbit, but they should serve to bring people back to you. Yes, exactly. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we have another question. Uh, what are some upcoming web design trends? I will let Nicole start with this one because I know she is a genius designer who follows these very carefully. Um, I mean, very much, and it's really funny that we covered a lot, but more white space. Um, <laughs> nice, um, you know, color choice palettes that's very dependent on industry and the product. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm seeing a lot more double calls to action. So instead of there being one button to contact us now, um, there'll be a contact us and maybe a learn more button. So then yep. the user has a choice, they're not forced to take a, a immediate action to get a hold of that person, book an appointment. Um, maybe they want to learn more about the site or what product or service you offer your company um, before committing to, you know, joining your practice or becoming mm -hmm. a patient or, or signing up to receive your newsletters. Um, so that definitely double call to action. I'm seeing a lot of that. Um, I'm seeing a lot of those statements, one such as statements about your business, what you do. Um, what you offer, quickly summarized. Um, and then, you know, just like we said, those lovely use of white space, increasing mm -hmm. that, all the content blocks and walls, um, and incorporating a lot more graphics and some of that kind of, you know, that peekaboo as you scroll down, mm -hmm. it becomes more interactive um, with the user. So really taking them on that complete uh, user experience and user journey through your website. Yeah, and to second that, I think the trend is more towards immersive, um, animative mm -hmm. experiences versus, yes. you know, the, like the old slideshows. I think those are falling out of favor um, with a bigger focus on like more static hero type images mm -hmm. and calls to action. Um, yeah. Very good. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, looks like that's all the questions we have for today. We do have okay. a couple of brief announcements though before we hang up. Um, wanted to remind everyone that the web or the PowerPoint and recording from today's briefing will be available tomorrow on the Open Minds website. And please 
consider joining us next week at uh, Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to have uh, Open Mind Senior Associate Aaron Pressel and Ben Salem Police Department Director of Public Safety Fred Heron, and they're going to talk about building community partnerships between provider organizations and police departments. And then we also have next month, August 23rd through 27th in Newport Beach, California, we have our Open Minds Man Management Best Practice Institute. Um, so you're not going to want to miss that. And if you can't join us in sunny Southern California, there are going to be some virtual elements of that. You can sign up at management.openminds.com. Um, and you can find anything for events at openminds.com under the events tab. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Laird and Nicole today. Um, and you. we'll see you next week. Yes, thank you guys very much.